Chris Herzog with teams 4292 and 4241. We're going to talk a little bit about the elevator system in our robot here. Some of the issues as far as the mechanics, how we're driving it, electrical concerns, and then we'll of course be able to see it in action. This video on First Updates Now is made possible by viewers like you and also the following sponsors. At Kettering University, over 30% of the student population was in high school robotics. These same students have received a portion of over $7 million in scholarships. Scholarship applications for FIRST students are now available. Get more information at kettering.edu slash FIRST. SOLIDWORKS is free for FIRST teams. Over 80% of U.S. engineering schools and 370,000 plus companies use SOLIDWORKS to design great products. SOLIDWORKS can help you design a great robot on desktop or on the cloud. Go to SOLIDWORKS.com slash FIRST to register your team. So let's take a look at a couple of the pieces here. This is using components from a couple of different manufacturers here. What we've seen here is the ThriftyBot bearings together with the AndyMark bearings. It's a fairly conventional design. We run on these one by two tubes here. They're a pair of rollers. They both constrain the carriage forward and, forward and back and side to side as we run along here. You'll see as the primary drive system for the elevator. Come around the back side here. There's a single Neo. It's driving through a four to one and a five to one rev gear box going through a right angle drive. It simply has a shaft going across with a, a, a sprocket on each side. Runs up top. We're doing some chain tensioning with this nylon rod fastened side to side. And this, it's really easy to do that because we've got the brace here. You definitely want to brace your, your, your elevator just attaching at the bottom's not gonna be enough down there. So you really wanna, wanna make sure that you brace it like that. So wiring for that's pretty conventional. When we get down to working the arm, we've got a sprocket and a triple reduction here, five, four to one, uh, five, four and a four to one. And then also we have a reduction here as far from the going from the, the sprocket to the sprocket on the arm. Right now, the arm stowed in the configuration as we would start it, so we won't do anything there yet. Uh, but once we get, get it moving, we'll touch in a couple of other things. Whenever you've got moving parts, wiring is an issue, particularly when you've got things that are powered or sensors on the moving parts. You need a way to get, to, to get your power and your signal wire, wires from that. We're using this cable chain here. It fastens on a bracket down on the chassis. The cables splay out to their appropriate places. It runs up, it comes down here, and now we feed out to the arm, to the, the uh, Spark Max that's driving that. The CAN bus extends up here, and it goes all the way out to the time of flight sensor that you saw in one of the other videos. That's where the CAN bus terminates. In this case, our motor controller is on the fixed part of the elevator. Our other motor controllers are also on the fixed part of the robot, so only we have, we have our varying power going up here. So Steve, can you uh, activate the robot and move us out of uh, our position here as if a match were starting? Okay, so the first thing that happens is our arm moves down. This is the pickup position. We've seen this operate already, so I won't go into that. But you can see a little bit of some of the issues with the wiring. We tried to design things to be modular as we were working on the different pieces so that we could we could both um, take parts off the robot, be able to maintain them or develop alternatives. So Anderson power poles, you see these all over the place. The cool thing is you can stack them up and make these compound connectors. So right here, we've got a two by three connector, takes care of both of our motors here, as well as power for our time of flight. Same thing, if you look in the back here, coming up, Here's a combination, another two by two combination. There's our red or our red and black for power. And then the, you know, everybody's favorite green and yellow, the CAN bus. That takes care of all of that. So we can unplug these things, disconnect all that from the from the robot very easily. That's an important deal. So one thing we noticed is as we went to stow the arm, we wanted to make sure that we didn't have any damage. We took an old pool noodle here and use that to kind of as a buffer block for our starting position. Um, one thing we're gonna be handling in software, if you notice we tuck a little under the elevator here, we don't wanna raise the elevator unless the arm comes down. So the plan is when the match starts, one of the first things that'll happen is our arm is gonna move forward to get into a safe position and then the drivers can manipulate it. 
there's no need for us to, st to go all the way back. So we can effectively set like a software zero here to prevent somebody from uh, raising the arm to where we would do damage. So, um, so Steve, you want to raise it on up there. You'll be able to see the, the drive shaft across here, both the sprockets driving up and tensions being set by this. You can see the cable chain moving. You can drop it back down. It's a great setup. You know, these, these are very valuable to use because they'll keep your, your cables between the moving parts out of your moving parts, which is really important. Um, so, Steve, you can go ahead and maybe run her up and down, run the arm back and forth a little bit. They're all independently controlled. And you notice here, this is our drive mechanism. It's a fairly conventional sort of, uh, you know, elbow or shoulder joint as people might refer to it. We've got a tensioner here that helps us set final tension, this sort of uh, seashell shaped, nautilus shaped cam there that lets us set the appropriate tension. Chains are a challenge. We, we had a challenge here because some of our, several of our dimensions were already set. We had to, had to try to accommodate that with the chain, make a few modifications, because we couldn't, you, you, your chain has very specific lengths. So that's a, that's a challenge when you're, when you're dealing with that. All right, well, thanks for watching. If you've got questions, you can, you can uh, feed them into the comments section. Check out all of the fun channel for information, and thanks for checking out what we're doing here at RI3D Redux. This video on First Updates Now is made possible by viewers like you and also the following sponsors. SOLIDWORKS is free for FIRST teams. Over 80% of U.S. engineering schools and 370,000 plus companies use SOLIDWORKS to design great products. SOLIDWORKS can help you design a great robot on desktop or on the cloud. Go to SOLIDWORKS.com slash FIRST to register your team. At Kettering University, over 30% of the student population was in high school robotics. These same students have received a portion of over $7 million in scholarships. Scholarship applications for FIRST students are now available. Get more information at Kettering.edu slash FIRST. Thank you to all of our suppliers and sponsors for the Robot in 3 Days Redux and Kettering Bulldogs programs.